Okay, let's try this again. Um, actually, I'm going to turn off the light here. So that seems a bit blinding. Um, okay, so um, we're going to refilm this entire lecture. Um, the good news is, is that I have a new camera. Um, most of the complicated calculations have kind of moved on for you guys. Um, but I do have the ability to uh, kind of tip this and do calculations, um, which means they're all filmed at the same ratio, uh, which means I can thread them together. Not so great for you guys at this point. Um, super handy for the grad students who are just getting into the heavy math right now. Um, so this lecture is a little bit lighter than the ones you've had in the past. Um, there is some math, but it's the math is simple, um, and the concepts are not hard. Um, some people tend to get kind of bogged down by them, but hopefully you guys will kind of understand the intent where we've shifted it to slightly later in the term that you guys will really kind of have a better understanding of the rest of what's going on. Um, the new camera freaks me out a little bit. It's a fish, more of a fisheye lens. Um, I don't think anyone ever feels good looking at themselves in a fisheye lens, but um, it allows us to do this work, so I'm gonna roll with it. Um, so today's lecture, we're gonna start, we're gonna break each material up into two parts. We're gonna talk about basic construction of the material to kind of give you a sense of uh, how we, how we, uh, what, how we work with the material, how we would put preliminary sizes on our drawings. Um, and then um, the second part of either, the second lecture will be um, how do we actually design with that material. I'm going to show you some complicated math that you guys aren't going to have to do because then I'm going to immediately show you the shortcut that you guys will get to use um, where basically I will show you where the math comes from and then I will show you how it's been done by a bunch of engineers so there are tables that have most of the information you need. And I will give you the tables so that you can look that up. The thing you will need is your sizing guidelines. That has been uploaded uh, to Quercus. You should have that. Um, it's a whole PDF of all of the different materials. I've pulled the important ones for steel and put them in this lecture, but you should make sure you have that PDF accessible to you. You'll find it really handy. So let's start talking about what steel looks like, what's it available in, how would we so how would we do preliminary sizes for a set of drawings before you've even hired an engineer, and then what does basic steel construction look like? So steel kind of comes in two major forms. We have our hot rolled and our cold rolled steel sections. The hot rolled sections um, are literally hot rolled. If there's no mystery in the name, we take um, a, a long bar of steel, heat it up to red hot, like ridiculously hot, um, and then roll it back and forth between um, some machines. And it'll start to take on its form. And you pass it back and forth several times until eventually it's got the form that we're trying to make it take. Um, the heating process, um, changes the properties just a tiny little bit, mostly because of how it cools down and how we rolled it, um, but it's only small changes, and I'll show you that later when we talk about the steel properties. Um, it kind of gives it a black surface. It's like the, 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 the slag or the mill dust kind of stuck to it. Um, that changes to rust very easily on site, so you'll often hear it called black steel because right after it's been hot rolled, it's black. Uh, but then once it shows up on site, it often rusts and turns quite orange. Um, 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 most of our structural members are hot rolled. Probably the, 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 the majority of them. And the complex ones are definitely hot rolled. Um, uh, these usually need um, some something done to them if you're going to expose them. Because you, if you brush up against them, you get dirty and rusty. Uh, you can put um, oil on them. That's what a lot of people will do if they want to expose it. Um, you can paint it. There's priming and paintings you can do to it. Um, some people do let it rust. You can even get particular steel that you let rust on purpose or core temp. Um, 
The hot rolled sections have a hard time getting sharp edges wherever we roll it. Um, so for me, I have done all of this stuff for you already yesterday. So rather than draw it again, I can show you this image right here. And so these, these corners would all be very sharp edges because we're not rolling that part. All of these parts where we're rolling them have a rounded edge. Sometimes architects like a nice crisp clean edge because of a shadow cast or uh, how it draws the eye. So um, hot rolled sections are going to have a lot of rounded edges in them. Cold rolled um, is literally where we don't heat the steel up and we bend it or press it into the shape we want. It. Here's a piece of flat steel being pressed into shape. Um, you can normally tell cold rolled stuff because it's shiny and silver. Um, it looks quite nice. Um, if we need to, we can bend it into shape and then even weld it. So our HSS sections, which would look like this here, is a piece of flat steel that got bent here and here and then here and here until it joined right here and they would weld it up down its entire length to give us an HSS section. So these are just, this is just an image of some of the common steel sections. Um, they come in a variety of dimensions and sizes. Um, so let's just talk about what this means. There's a lot of information in the name itself. Um, and we do that to make it easy to talk about some of these things. I am gonna open up our steel properties, uh, steel sections. So I'm going to open up the table for steel sections so that we can see at a glance what I'm talking about. You are not seeing this because it is on a different monitor. There we are. Okay, so this image right here is exactly what we are looking at. I've switched my monitors so it's not as easy for me to jump around between the things. Um, that's exactly this image that we're looking at right here. Um, uh, the naming convention for our W sections is W, the dimension, and then the weight. Um, why do we call it a W section? Well, they're wide, well, they're, they're wide flanged sections. Back in the day, um, I-beams were the common uh, members. And as we got better at making factories that allow us to roll these sections, or we got better technology to make that happen, they started creating these new wider flanged sections. Um, so they were the new bad boys on the market, and we needed some, not we, this was long, 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 long before my time, some way to identify them. Um, so these were the uh, wide flange sections. Now the I-beams, don't really get used that much. And so we'll even call the W sections I-beams occasionally, um, but they are uh, the kind of standard structural section. So that's the W. The second number is the dimension, but it's only the approximate dimension. So that's how deep the object is, or D, from the top to the bottom. Um, and it's not the exact dimension. So if we say it's a W130, it's around, sorry, a W150, it's around 150 millimeters deep. Let's actually take a look at some of the W150s. Let's, uh, make that a little bit bigger. Um, we're in the W360s. Let's just bop this along to the W150s here. Okay, so W150s, we've got uh, eight, seven of them. Let's come over to where it tells us the actual depth of those. So our W150s vary in depth from 148 to 162 millimeters. So it really is an approximation. The second number, so if these are W1150s, um, was that the example I was looking at, was it W150? I think so. 
The next number is the weight or how much it weighs in kilograms per meter. So a W150 by 37, every meter length of it weighs 37 kilograms. Um, a W150 by 13, every meter length of it weighs 13 kilograms. So it's almost three times the weight for W150 by 37. Um, the reason we put that number right there, everything's really governed by cost. Um, steel, we usually have a pretty good idea of what it costs, or at least the relative cost based on the weight. Um, we tend to buy steel by the pound. There is some variety between whether it's an HSS or a W section, but for the most part, it's by the pound. So a W150 by 37 is going to be almost three times the price as a W150 by 13, or two and a half times the price. Um, if they both work structurally, why would we put the heavier one on if we didn't have to? Because we want to make sure we can build the cheapest building we possibly can within our constraints. Cheap does not mean crappy. Cheap means that we are meeting all our constraints. We have a safe building. We've met, met our design intent. We've, we've met our serviceability criteria. If we've done all of those things, then we want to make sure we have the cheapest option available. Um, we can also get the information about the width. Um, we often call the width of beams B. Um, and we can tell what the thickness of the web, that's the up and down bit, so how thick the web is, and how thick the flanges are. So that's the top and bottom cords. Channels, very similar process to the W sections. They're rolled into shape. The one nice thing is that this side of the bar doesn't get any rolling done to it, so it has nice crisp edges. We use channels a lot for uh, stair stringers. Yeah, you see them quite often for stair stringers. Um, again, the naming convention is the same. C is telling us it's a channel. So the C is telling us it's a channel. The first number is telling us the approximate depth or approximately how deep it is. We can look up what the actual depth is. No problem, I've given you the steel sections. You can look that up. Um, and the second number is the, the weight of it in kilograms per meter. We can also pull the information for its width. Angles. Angles are also a hot rolled section, so you can tell that by the, by the rounded sides here. Um, but it also has these sharp sides. So it's that combination of the two that lets you know that we've got a hot rolled section. Angles are different in their naming convention in that they give us nothing but exact dimensions. So uh, L tells us it's an angle. A 102 is telling us that it is exactly 102 millimeters deep. The 76 is telling us that it is exactly 76 millimeters wide. And the 9.5 is telling us that both of these elements here are exactly 9.5 millimeters thick. So we can get a lot of real information about the sizes in the name, but there's nothing about the weight. We would have to look that up. The one good thing about the angles, and remember, we like to know that weight so that we can comparatively see kind of what our cost is. An angle, it's usually pretty visually obvious. Um, if you're talking about an L152 by 76 by 9.5 versus a 102 by 76 by 9.5, you can visibly see that it's going to be the more, or you could probably even just tell that it's going to be the heavier one. Um, so uh, we'd know that pretty easily which one's the cheaper one. Um, but you can look up that exact um, weight as well. HSS sections. HS, HSSs are cold roll. They come in round, uh, square, and rectangular. Um, they can come in elliptical. Um, anytime I have tried to use the elliptical, um, it's because salesmen have come around from some plants that said, we have elliptical HSSs, it's the new big thing. 
um, put them on all your drawings if your architect wants to. And they go around to the architect's office as well, and all the architects are like, this is fantastic, this is what I want to do. And then we put it on the drawing, and that company has gone out of business, or it's going to take 12 months to get them on site, um, and they get cut from the project, or they're just not available. Um, and then a year or two will go by and another salesman will come in from another company or they bought that company uh, and the whole thing kind of starts again. I have yet to ever have an actual structural elliptical get put on a project. What I have had happen, and I didn't draw this one yesterday, it's a bonus for you guys, is we will have this structural part right here, and then a thin little plate welded onto it. Um, that plate wouldn't be structural. Um, otherwise, we'd have to do all kinds of fancy stuff to get that to bond together. We would be having to make it composite, and we're going to talk about composite in four lectures, three lectures? Um, four lectures. Um, but it's all about making two disparate things work together structurally. Um, and we're going to see why it's really important. Um, so we wouldn't be able to use that structurally. You can weld it, grind it, fill it with epoxy, and sand it down and paint it, and you'd never know. Um, some architects, though, get really offended um, because they, they just say that that's not real, that's not structure, it's just an ornamentation or decoration, and they don't want to use it. So fair enough. Um, so just be aware that elliptical, although available, kind of not really available. The naming convention is exact dimensions. So as much as it's cold roll, um, it doesn't have sharp edges uh, because it's being bent into shape. The, the sharp edges only really exist on the things that haven't been rolled or bent. Um, so the dimensions are the exact dimensions. Um, a 152 by 102 by 6.4, exactly 152 millimeters deep, exactly 102 millimeters wide, and the piece of plate that it was bent, that was used to bend it, was 6.4 millimeters thick. Again, no weight information there, but often very easy to tell which one's heavier than which. Um, the round one, B and D, would both be the exact dimension of that circle. So it doesn't matter what way you go, it's the same dimension. I've given you the full section list, um, but for sizing guidelines, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, you wouldn't need to go open the bind or the, the PDF and look at all of the available sizes and write exactly which one you want to use. Um, these values are what I'm looking for. Um, so if we want to know how what we want for uh, a beam and we calculate that something it needs to be 340 millimeters deep, well, a W360 is what we're looking for is the answer there. We want to go we want to round up to the next available size and make sure we put that on our drawings. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we come back to it. But when I say pick something that's available or reasonable, this is the chart that I'm talking about here. There's some other shapes. We have um, uh, heavy eye shapes, light ones. There's T channel, there's T sections. There's odd channels. Um, there's cold formed uh, uh, sections. These would be by an actual supplier. Um, we have wide welded flanges or welded wide flanges. Those are, if we don't have sections available that they typically make, we can make our own section. So that would be this element right here. Um, I have had to do this on several of the larger projects I've worked on where essentially what they do is they take three plates, top plate, bottom plate, web plate, so top flange, bottom flange, web, and then they have to weld the whole length of the beam in four spots. So you can imagine it's really, really, really expensive. Labor is the expensive thing 
in our construction market. So using um, that much labor to weld it together, and expensive labor too, like a really uh, a well-trained person has to be doing that. So um, they're not they're not our first choice, um, but they can be made if needed. So you guys should recognize this. It's what we talked about last week. It's the steel stress strain curve. Um, we know steel has a few kind of fun properties that work really well for us. Uh, we have our stress on this side and our strain on this side. Strain is telling us, talking about deformation and stress is talking about force. Um, the relationship between stress and strain in the elastic zone is linear and it is represented by E or the slope of that line or the modulus of elasticity and it gives us an indication of how stiff the material is. Um, if the section is um, uh, ductile, we will come up to a yield stress and that is when we start to see permanent deformation. If we unload our object after this point, there will be permanent deformation involved in the member. Um, so yield stress, sometimes called FY for steel. Um, uh, so at that point, we start to get ductile behavior and we, get lar we can get large deformations. It will deform and continue to take some load up until an ultimate force. And that will be the maximum stress that our object can possibly see. After that, um, it will rapidly deform until we meet our rupture failure or the strain where it actually fails or rupture. For our structural sections, um, our structural steel is 350 MPA steel. Um, for a cold rolled section, no problem. We just take our steel and bend it up and we've got 350 MPA steel. I said that when we hot roll steel, it does undergo some changes. That heating it up and then cooling it down where it's kind of different thicknesses now, causes some small change in the steel. And instead, we would only design 345 MPA with our hot roll sections. So that's our W sections, our C channels, and our angles. Um, so FY, or our yield stress for structural steel, 345 if it's hot roll, 350 if it's cold roll. Our ultimate stress for structural steel is 450 MPA. And it doesn't matter which one we're talking about, it's 450 MPA. E, we all know is 200,000 MPA. Uh, G, which is our modulus of rigidity and is not something you really need to know about, but it's all about how much our object bulges when we put load on it, is directly related to E. Um, and uh, there are other things involved with it, but all you really need to know is that it's 77,000 MPA. So what are the, why and why wouldn't we build with steel? I am personally a steel fanatic. It tends to be my favorite construction material. Um, I design in all things, um, and obviously the movement is wood right now, so I do a lot of kind of wood design. In fact, Dave and I are giving a a talk on Monday night um, to the, uh, the the Wood Society in uh, Australia, and we're talking about reciprocal frames. So October nineteenth, if anybody feels like signing up, I think it's a, it's free to sign up um, at eight p.m. It's just a it's not it's not reciprocal frames aren't going to save the world, but they're a fun kind of unique method to build with that actually do solve some real structural problems sometimes. Not always. It's not always the right solution. And anyway, that's a separate thing. That's the wood, that's the wood thing. We'll talk about that later. So why and why wouldn't we build with steel? Well, steel is strong and it's stiff and it's light. It's not light though. It weighs way, way, way more than concrete. In fact, three times as much as concrete, pretty much. But it's so strong and it's so stiff that we need so much less of it than we need concrete that it ends up being the lighter system for a building. So even though the material itself is heavier, the amount we need to hold everything up actually has less structural weight 
than the concrete version of it would. Um, we can do long spans with it really easily. So it, it solves, like if we need wide open bays, steel can really solve that problem. We end up with small columns. Um, if you have um, retail space and your, 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 your client is trying to maximize you know, square footage sales space, having small columns is gonna be huge. Uh, it's really easy to maintain quality control for steel. Um, steel gets made in a plant where there's a chemist who's actually testing the material um, versus concrete where just a bunch of stuff is thrown in the back of a truck and it gets spun around on its way to the site. With concrete, we don't even know what we've got until 7 to 28 days after we pour the concrete. Um, uh, it's also easy because for quality control because um, when it's being fabricated, uh, they're inside, they're working comfortably, they're not trying to rush and do things in the cold or the heat. Um, and then when it's on site, um, there's actually very little structure and everything that connects all the bits is usually vis visibly exposed when we go to the site to take a look at it. So it's really easy to see if there is a problem that we can see it very easily. It gets installed fast. So the steel goes up very, very quickly. Um, just because I'm talking about this, I'm going to mention that in the disadvantages, there's a long lead time. So from the time you decide you want to build your project to the time you actually start building your project, there is a long lag with steel construction. But once the steel gets onto site, it starts to go really, really fast. Um, concrete can mobilize almost immediately, but it's a much slower construction process. Normally, not a big deal. The reason it might matter is some contracts are worked that payment won't be released from the bank until you've met certain construction milestones. So if your first um, payment can only happen when you're 10% um, into construction, your steel isn't even on site and concrete might already be at 20%, even though the ultimate start to finish date might be the exact same. Or, and by start, I mean deciding to actually hire someone to do the project. Uh, future alterations are really easy in steel. Um, steel uh, is local, a local um, kind of uh, structural element. So if we have a floor, we have joists or beams periodically that you can have holes down through it. Um, if we are talking about our walls, um, we have columns. Maybe there's a brace in between there, but the rest of it is not structural. Um, so if you wanted to come in later and put an opening in, it could be quite easy. Whereas concrete, we don't really know where the structural components are. Uh, there's a fabrication benefit. It's really easy to create trusses. Um, it gets created in the plant or in the fabrication shop. So people can work comfortably in the warmth. They're not dealing with sub-zero temperatures and high temperatures. Um, and it also makes it easy to do fit-ups and testing and see if everything's going to go together the way we want. Steel is non-combustible. That means it won't burn. It will not contribute to spreading the fire. Um, it's, it's my birthday today and I have a friend who's sending me a Star Trek meme an hour. They've decided that's their gift to me. Um, they're sending me a Star Trek meme every hour for the entire day. Um, so steel won't burn. So everything around it could burn, but it itself won't burn. It will not be responsible for propagation of the flame. The element, other elements in the building might though. So if I, we come over to disadvantages, um, I've talked about long lead time. Steel has a poor fire rating. So as much as it won't burn, it is susceptible to the things around it burning. Meaning as the things around it burn it burn and it heats up, it loses structural properties. Um, a good example of this um, is actually the uh, collapse of the Twin Towers. They were designed to withstand the impact of a plane and they did that. I mean, obviously locally there was um, extraordinary damage um, but the buildings themselves did not collapse due to the plane hitting them. Um, the thing that wasn't anticipated in that was the jet fuel burning at 
the uh, at the just kind of improb ridiculously high temperatures that jet fuel burns at. Um, and so as much as the steel wasn't burning, um, the fires were so hot that the steel lost its structural integrity um, and helped propagate the collapse. Now, there was other things involved with that, um, lots of other things. Um, not all of them um, kind of really obvious or a thing happening independently. Um, you know, when you set out to destroy something, you can destroy almost everything, and that's not typically... We, d we don't tend to design buildings to prevent people from trying to destroy them. Um, and even in the, that building, they did try and succeeded pretty well, um, in, in my opinion, um, for as long as it did, considering it withstood the actual impact of the plane. Again, horrible tragedy, um, and, and ultimately the structural failure resulted in, you know, massive casualties. Um, but, you know, that isn't kind of the normal thing that we're talking about with buildings, but fire can lead to um, uh, loss of structural properties of steel, even though it's not burning itself. Steel isn't great for vibration. Because it is strong and stiff, um, we don't need much of it. And if we don't need much of it, there's not that much mass to help prevent vibration. Um, so it is susceptible to vibration quite often. Um, another disadvantage is depth, which seems kind of weird because we don't need as much steel. But if you look at um, a steel floor and a concrete floor, um, our concrete is a consistent depth over the whole floor. Our steel has a deck, um, but it is um, locally much deeper because of our W sections. Maybe that's not a big deal, and you can put your ductwork in here, and you'd be very happy about that because your ductwork over here has to go underneath. But what about the ductwork in the other direction? You can't pass through these beams because the duct is actually bigger than the beam. So in that case, you have to pass your duct underneath, and that could have um, real headroom issues. Um, uh, sorry, more Star Trek names. So those are the advantages and disadvantages of steel construction. When do we use steel? And these are not, you will use steel for this construction. But I am talking about the majority of the time you will probably look at steel first. Um, and maybe not only steel. Some of these are great in steel, but they might be great in another material as well. So I'm just talking about things that might be good in steel. Um, very low and very high buildings work really well in steel. Um, we're going to talk about why, mostly because concrete isn't great for those two applications. Um, and we'll talk about that more next week with concrete. Shopping centers, hospitals, schools, all great. They can be good in masonry or concrete as well, but they're good. Steel is a really good choice for those. Warehouses and industrial buildings are almost exclusively steel construction. Um, those nice long spans where we can have like trucks running around inside the building. Um, we often really like to build our warehouses out of steel. The last one is systems. So systems buildings, I'm talking about proprietary structural systems. You might have heard the name Balin buildings or Butler buildings. Um, those are two of the common ones in North America. Um, these are often rinks um, or uh, kind of um, community center style construction. Um, the problem is often that the architect loses some design control. Um, they have a very refined engineering process uh, that can end up um, uh, maybe not always being as aesthetically demanding as what the architect might want, um, but they're very cheap, very versatile buildings, so they very much have a place. If you play hockey or soccer, you have probably been in a Butler or Balin building. So now let's actually put something on a drawing. We are going to use our sizing guidelines to tell us what size members we need for our project or 
what would go on our drawing. Now, size and guidelines are not a final answer. These are not designed. These are, hey, we've done this enough that we know that these are pretty good estimates of what we need. Um, you might even want to call them a guesstimate. So it gives you an approximate depth of beam. So when I say depth, depth is this dimension or this dimension or this dimension. Um, we're talking about guess or putting or estimating the approximate depth of beam or the width of a column um, based on how long the element is. Um, I like to remind people here that everything you need to know about structures, you already know. If you look at it and it seems too small, that's because it's probably too small. Also, stop and pay attention to the application. Um, if you know that it is a 45-story building and we're talking about the column from level 44 to 45, we're going to get the exact same sizing guideline result as if it was the column from the ground floor to the second floor. That does not make any sense. One column is holding up one story. The other column is holding up 45 stories of weight. You would imagine it would be 45 times the size or require 45 times as much ability to hold load. So the sizing guidelines would give us the exact same answer. That's where you having an understanding of what's happening in the building becomes, becomes important. What would you do there? I don't know. You'd have to really think about the context. These are, these sizing guidelines apply in the rule, in the zone of normal. So we're talking about when things are normal. Um, and so if steel columns work really well in low buildings, we're probably talking about a column that's holding up a few stories of steel. The sizing guidelines assume that there is a linear relationship between depth and length. That is absolute bullcrap. There is not a linear relationship between depth and length. But in the realm of the normal things, linear is probably a good place to start. Next week, we're going to talk about why it is not linear and what that looks like. Um, but for our sizing guidelines, assuming a, a linear relationship between depth and length is an appropriate thing to do. So if we know the length, and we know the sizing guideline, we take the length, we divide it by the sizing guideline, and that will say, hey, here's a pretty good depth of member you should use for this design member. That means if we know how deep something is, we could estimate how long it should be or what the maximum we'd want, the maximum length we'd want to span that member would be. So the size and guideline will be close to the final designed member, um, it, like I said, if we're in the range of normal application. So when wouldn't the size and guidelines be helpful? Sorry, I was up for a ridiculously long time and filming the same lecture for the second time, just two lectures for the second time in a day because I had to refilm the graduate lecture as well. It's boring as hell. So um, I'm sorry, I'm maybe not as enthusiastic about this one as I, as I was maybe yesterday. Um, so the members, uh, the, the sizing guidelines might not be the best if we have really large loads in the building or we know that the, there's something interesting happening there. Uh, if we're spanning extraordinarily long distances, uh, if there's a unique layout that steel isn't normally used in, if we have large transfers, so we have a beam here and a 45-story column coming down on it, and then this beam spans to get rid of the column from that, for that story. That would be an unusual use of these elements. Um, or if we, we're using the material in a unique way, we're doing something with the steel that we wouldn't normally do. So let's start with our metal deck. Metal deck is... Um, a cold form steel element um, that essentially is a series of very small beams. So kind of each one of these little sections is a beam and we just have all kinds of them side by side and they're so close together we might as well glue them together or make them out of one piece of steel. 
So they span in the direction of those flutes. Um, if you pick that up in the other direction, it would be really floppy. Um, I actually have a piece of corrugated steel out in the back. I should, I should, if it wasn't raining, go out and show you how different it is in both directions. Um, most things come in typical sizes. Metal deck, 38 millimeters deep, is just the norm. That is your standard metal deck that you're going to use on the majority of projects. Yes, there is a 76 millimeter deep deck. Don't use it unless you have to. It is going to only increase the cost of your building. I can show you the complex calculation that results in that, but how about I just tell you, start with 38 metal deck, go to 76 only if you need to because you know why you might need to. I'm not saying don't use 76 millimeter deck, but don't start with 76 millimeter deck. There is a premium you're gonna pay for that. Typically, our metal deck is gonna be 0.91 millimeters thick. Um, the deck, the, the, the length deck can span is what often sets how far apart the things that support the deck is. So if our most common, um, our most common size is 38 millimeter deck, and our sizing guideline is 50 millimeters. Let's do that calculation. 38 times 50 is about 1.9 to 2 meters is about how far our deck can span. So if our deck can span about 2 meters, um, our whatever supports it needs to be every 2 meters. So our major first structural members are going to be about 2 meters on center or our purlins or our open lip stick joists. So let's do the calculation. If our joists are two meters on center, what depth of deck should we use? So what we're saying here, now these I've drawn, I've drawn these as purlins, but if these are two meters apart, what depth does this deck need to be? So our deck is spanning two meters. It's going from, from joist to joist. Now I'm, I'm drawing W sections, I know, but this is just to kind of give you that illustration. So it's spanning two meters. Our sizing guideline is 50. So 2000 divided by 50 is 40 millimeters. That is pretty darn close to our 38 millimeters. Anything else, round up. Um, but two millimeters is pretty darn close. We would want to use 38 millimeter deck to uh, 38 millimeter deck would be totally appropriate for this application. So now let's talk about concrete on metal deck. So metal deck, often used for roofs. Concrete on metal deck, we like to have a wearing surface for feet or for an application of whatever our flooring is. Um, we're worried about vibration. We often have higher loads on floors. Um, and then because we need concrete for damping and vibration anyway, um, it's actually heavier as well. So our common concrete on metal deck system um, is 38 millimeter deck with 64 millimeters of concrete on top. So when I say 64 millimeters, I mean from the top of the steel to the top of the concrete. Um, our metal deck is the exact same metal deck we used for our roof or our metal deck system. They've just punched some little holes in the side of it. And that's just so when the concrete cures, the steel kind of grabs the concrete. Again, it makes this a composite system. And we're going to talk about composite in a couple lectures when we talk about concrete. Um, so the most common assembly, like I said, is 64 millimeters of normal density concrete on 38 metal... 38 millimeters of metal deck. Um, again, like our metal deck, this typically sets how far, how far apart the purlins or the open lip steel joists are. Our sizing guideline is 20, so whatever our length is divided by 20 is how deep our system needs to be. So if our joists are at two meters on center, what depth deck should we use? So 2000 divided by 20 is 100, well, that's perfect. Our 64 millimeter on 38 metal deck is 102 millimeters. So it seems like the perfect system. So now are you asking yourself, why would the concrete on metal deck, which is deep and strong, 
only span the same distance as the metal deck by itself. And that is where I was saying, um, it's often heavier loads. We've got the weight of the concrete itself, all contributing to why they both end up following the same span. Um, even though the sizing guidelines are different, it's uh, all about them being able to span about two meters. So our 102 millimeter depth deep system, composite metal deck system is perfect. And so again, what, if this can only span about two meters, it means that whatever picks it up should be about every two meters. So whether we're talking about metal deck or concrete on metal deck, our joists or purlins are going to be about every two meters on center. So now let's talk about the thing that's picking up the metal deck or the concrete on metal deck. Um, one of the things that can pick it up is open web steel joists. Open web steel joists are made by a manufacturer and they typically come in increments of two inches or we're going to talk metric and say 50 millimeters. Um, uh, you need a lot of them for them to be economical. You wouldn't only put three open web steel joists on a project. Um, but if you had, um, you know, 300 of the same tributary width and span, um, you would definitely want to make use of open web steel joists. They can be really economical in that respect. Um, and then if you had some weird conditions that had a few different spots, you wouldn't get different open web steel joists you'd probably use a steel section in those spots. So how deep would our open web steel joists need to be if they're spanning nine meters? We know nothing else about this building, so we're kind of left um, uh, with no information except being able to use the sizing guidelines. So nine meters divided by 16 gives us 562.5 millimeters. Um, we know that open web steel joists come in increments of 50 millimeters. So 550 or 600, but we wouldn't want to we wouldn't want to put on our preliminary drawing something smaller than it estimated, only because it, it we might do the final design and find that a 550 works just fine, but it would be horrible to put 550 on our drawings, go out tender the project, have all of our sections designed, and then find out we really needed 600 deep open web steel joists. And now there's not enough headroom in our building to make everything work. So we want to go with the bigger section so that we make sure we don't have a nasty surprise when it actually comes time to do the final design of the building. So a 600 open web steel joist seems like it, a 600 millimeter deep open web steel joist seems like it would be a really good idea. If this is a normal building and we better hope it is because we're using our sizing guidelines. Um, a normal building, open web steel joists are supporting metal deck or concrete on metal deck. So if that's the case, how far apart should these open web steel joists be? Well, we know that two meters is a pretty good span for our metal deck or our concrete on metal deck. So for these to be 600 deep open web steel joists spanning two meters, or them being every two meters seems like a really good idea. So this is everything I just said. Let's talk about our beams now. So our beams, um, this is where I want you to think back to the tributary area lecture I gave you. If we came across that river in the woods, it didn't matter if it was a creek or a river or a brook, um, we just cared that it was a river. It was only in context that we might have said, oh, this is a really high flowing river, this one's a medium flowing river, and this is a small flowing river. It's the same way we talk about beams. A beam is a beam is a beam. It's an element that's in bending. It's, it is spanning some distance and it has some depth um, and it is in bending. So it, well, maybe we'll, it has, it has some depth and it is bending. Depending on how hard it's working, we will use different sizing guidelines. 
And if we're doing that, we might as well give those types of beams a name. So a beam that isn't working that hard, and it is every two meters on center, about every two meters on center, and picking up the deck, that is a beam we would call a purlin. Um, so interchangeable almost with an open web steel joist. And the size and guideline is L divided by 25. A beam is a moderately hard working structural member. It is often supporting the open web steel joists or purlins. Or as those span, as the open web steel joists or purlins span, they sit on a beam. A girder, again, just another type of beam, but it is a beam that is working extra hard. It probably has um, a, a point load on it, or um, it's picking up another beam, or there's a column above on it. It is something that is working extra hard. Now, I have seen people size something as a girder, they didn't like the size, and they said, oh, I'm just going to make it a beam. But just saying you want to make it a beam isn't enough. You have to get rid of the constraints that make it a beam. Make it a beam. So if that girder is supporting a column above at the middle of it, just saying I'm going to call it a beam, you're going to size something smaller, you're going to put it on your preliminary drawings, and then when the design comes, you're going to have an unpleasant surprise to find out that that element needs to be a lot deeper. Um, beams would often be a W section. Um, it could be a channel, um, but there's just not that many sizes available for channels. It can be an HSS, um, but usually the cheapest option, if it works, is going to be a W section. Width is ridiculously inaccurate. In fact, I don't even want you to use B in these calculations. I don't want you to say this is how wide my element is. The only reason I'm giving you this in the sizing guidelines is because it might help you draw something that looks normal. So it doesn't kind of mess with your head as you look at it. Um, you know, I drew all of these beams and they look like something relatively normal um, because they're all about half to a third of the depth. Um, if I had drawn something much more squat than that, you would have found it unnerving. Um, so, for example, if I had drawn um, a W section that looked like this, I'll show you in a second, don't worry. If I had drawn either of of these two things, you would say, oh, those look weird. Um, I know those don't seem very right. So this two to three or two or half or to a third is just about helping you draw something. I am not even going to ask that of you. So if we had a beam that was in, uh, somebody said, hey, what, what preliminary size do we need for a beam that's 8.5 meters long? And they walk off and you're like, oh, I don't know if it's a purlin, a beam, or a girder. So I'm going to give them the feedback that I'm going to size it no matter what. If we had a set of drawings, we'd look at it and we'd be able to say, oh, that's just supporting deck and there's a bunch of them every two meters. It's a purlin. Oh, that is a beam that is picking up open web steel joists or purlins. That is obviously a beam. Or that is a beam that is doing some crazy stuff. That's probably a girder. But they haven't given us that info, so we're going to size it as all three options. Um, so if it was a purlin, we would take the length and divide it by 25, and we would get 340 millimeters. Um, so we want to make sure we give ourselves enough room to fit in our beam. Um, so we would go to the, ne to the next available size, which would be a C380 or a W360. Um, so that's going back to that list of structural numbers that are available. If we sized it as a beam, uh, if we looked at the drawings and found out that it was actually a beam, we would have our uh, 8.5 meters divided by 20, and we would get 425 millimeters. Or that is saying we should probably draw a, w3, a W460 on our structural drawings for that number. If we had the liberty of seeing what the structural drawings were, 
um, or even what the, the architectural drawings were, uh, we might be able to see that this was in fact a girder. And if so, it would be 8.5 meters divided by 15, and we would get that it needs to be 567 millimeters deep. Um, so I'd probably start drawing a W610 on my drawings. If the purlins were supporting metal deck or concrete on metal deck, we know that they should be about two meters on center because that's about how far the deck could spin. So we would have C380s or W360s at two meters on center. I'm just gonna pause this for a minute and then I'm gonna come right back to you guys. Okay, so trusses um, are made by the manufacturer. Sorry, manufacturer is probably not the right word, but fabricator. They are not mass produced. They can be for a project, but they're not um, kind of off the shelf where they make them and we find the one that works for us. They are often custom made um, where we have a project where we say, okay, we need this truss made and we will give them the loading and they will make the truss we actually need. Sometimes we might even engineer it ourselves so that we can have it be exactly what we need it to be. Sorry, I feel like I'm actually gonna fall asleep. I've never been in this position. Normally I'm standing up and walking around. Um, so I'm eating essentially pure sugar, nerd candies uh, to try to keep myself awake right now. Oh, I fully apologize. This is not how I normally do these lectures. Um, so um, if we had a truss that we wanted a duct to go right through here, we could custom engineer this to make it be exactly what we need it to be. Now, because it's custom, it could be whatever freaking depth we want it to be. But often, unless there's a reason not to, oh, I'm no, sorry, um, making it in 50 millimeter increments is pretty normal. So um, you could calculate that it need, like if you calculated that it needed to be, you know, um, 890 millimeters. You could make it 890 millimeters, but it would be probably more normal to just put 900 on the drawings. Um, I'd probably start there, and then if you need to work backwards, making it smaller wouldn't be a problem later. Okay, so what, what size does a truss need to be if it spans 8.5 meters? So our size and guideline tells us it needs to be um, 708 millimeters deep. We could make it 708 millimeters deep. That would be a little bit weird. Um, so we'd probably put 750 on the drums. We're going to give them something in two uh, inch increments. And so I'm telling you those are the answers I'm looking for. If you were on an actual project, you could probably do 708 millimeters exactly, but I would probably still just start with the 750. So columns, we would never make a column out of an angle or a channel. Not that we really saw those come up in our bending elements anyway. Um, the sizing guideline is really inaccurate for these. It can be h divided by 40 to h divided by 20. I'm going to tell you that I want you to use the h divided by 20, which works well for short, stocky columns and is pretty much the range that we're going to be talking about. So. These can be W sections or HSSs. The, the minimum dimension or the dimension we get from this is the minimum dimension. So um, if we wanted something square, they both need to be that size. If we wanted something rectangular, the calculation we get for our size and guidelines is the smallest side. So if you're doing a W section, you really need to pay attention and think about that. So you probably want something quite stocky if it's a W section. I'm only going to give you questions where we're really looking for an HSS for this. You can still have a W section as a column, but we often start with HSSs. Um, so if we have three meter tall columns, what size do we need that to be? So three meters divided by 20. We're going to get 150 millimeters. Luckily, we have HSSs that are 152 by 152. 
So 152, HSS 152 by 152 seems like a really good choice. Maybe we want a round HSS. <coughs> Talking while eating sour sugar candies as well. Um, a round HSS. We could do a 152 diameter HSS as well. We could look at the steel sections and find a W150 that's about 150 millimeters wide. Um, unless I had any other context, I'd probably go with the HSS for this. Why? There's lots of reasons. No particular one is right. Um, but typically we would draw an HSS unless we needed to switch to the W section. So let's take a look at a framing plan. We have a small building here that is eight meters wide and two bays of 12 meters. So we have one bay, two bays, each 12 meters. We have a deck that spans from here to here, but as much as that deck can be quite long, it can't span that far. So it needs to be supported on something that recurs in kind of a relatively normal pattern. We know that that tends to be about two meters. Um, the deck is gonna sit on joists or purlins that occur roughly every two meters. Look at this, we have two J01 and two B01. We know a purlin is really just a beam, so calling it um, second floor beam 01 is no problem at all. I mean, we could call this Bob if we wanted. This is just a label for it. This could be Jack and this could be Bob. It doesn't really matter. Um, but giving it a naming convention that makes a little bit of sense certainly isn't going to hurt the process. Um, we have some beams here that look like they're picking up joists and beams. So those seem like they would probably be what we would refer to as a beam. And then look at this one over here, 2B03. It is spanning all the way from here to here. See these beams? There's a break there. This beam spans from CO1 to CO2, and this beam spans from CO2 to CO1. 2B03 goes all the way from CO3 all the way over to the other CO3. So it's 24 meters long, and look, this column isn't something that it's sitting on. It's supporting the column, or it's a column above. So this member looks like it's probably working really hard, and it's probably a girder. What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Presents for my birthday. Yay. I think I'm going to be spoiled today. Um, so... Uh, we want to know, they've asked us, okay, so the floor to floor height is 3.2 meters. Um, we want to size the concrete on metal deck to D01. We want to size the joists and all the beams, including that girder, and uh, maybe give a truss as an alternate. Um, am I interrupting you? Is this okay? Um, and, and all of the columns. So let's take a look and do that calculation. So they've told us it's a concrete on metal deck which is nice, which makes sense. It's a floor. Um, if we go back and look at this, <clears throat> this deck we know goes all the way from here to here, but each small section is really only how far it's spanning. It's actually only spanning um, from support to support. So that's how long the span of the deck is or how long it is or the L we use. So this, if this is a full 24 meters, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 equal sections of it. So 24 meters divided by 13, each span length of deck is 1.846 millimeters. We divide that by 20, which is our size and guideline for concrete on metal deck, and we get 92 millimeters. Well. Perfect. Our concrete on metal deck that is the most normal thing in the world is 64 millimeters of concrete on 38 millimeters of metal deck, um, which is 102 millimeters. So that is perfect. Maybe we could make those joists further apart, but we really don't know what the context is. Also, 
It doesn't look like we'd be able to get rid of a whole joist because then our span length would be longer than two meters, which we know we wouldn't want to go further than that. 2J01. Well, it was spanning eight meters. We know our sizing guideline for open web steel joists is 16. So eight meters divided by 16 gives us 500 millimeters. Open web steel joists come in increments of uh, 50 millimeters typically. So a 500 millimeter open web steel joist seems like a pretty reasonable thing to put on our drawings. Purlin 2B01. Now, if we looked at that drawing, the joists and the purlins doing the exact same thing. So let's size the purlin. Same span, same spacing. We get our eight meters divided by 25. We get 320 millimeters deep. So that means we probably want a C380 or a W360. So yes, they are shallower than our open web steel joists. Our open web steel joists for the equivalent job are gonna be deeper. But if we have a lot of them, they're going to be, they're going to be cheaper in the end with less material. Um, the reason we might have both these, maybe there's um, a loading condition we know, know about, or maybe the duct takes a jog there. Um, there might be some really good reason why we switched from open web steel joists to purlins in that location. We don't know the context. We were given that plan and asked to size these things. So the span, same span, the purlins are shallower, but heavier. Beam 2B02, we know that it was spanning 12 meters. There was two of these beams. Our sizing guidelines for beams, and a beam is something that's supporting purlins or open web steel joists, which this looked like it was doing, um, gives us 600 millimeters. If we look at that list of available sizes, a W610 seems like a really good choice to put in that spot. Girder 2B03. Well, we know it's probably a girder because it looks like it's doing a hefty job. Um, it's spanning 24 meters and it had a column above. So our sizing guideline for a girder is the length divided by 15. That gives us 1600. Well, we know that we could make our own uh, WWF or wide welded flange. That seems expensive and maybe a bit ludicrous. Let's see if a truss would work. So if 2B03 was actually a truss, our sizing guideline is 24 meters divided by 12 or 200. So our truss would need to be two meters deep. How do you decide if you do a girder or a truss? I can't tell you the answer to that because it is 100% going to depend on the context of what you're talking about. So our example, it looks like this is, oops, sorry, you can't see that arrow, the arrow there. It looks like this is the exterior of our building. So a two meter truss seems like not that big a deal. Um, our story height is only 3.2 meters. Um, 3.2, um, it looks like even if it was the beam, we would have a hard time walking underneath that. So I would say that if that's in the middle of the building, you're gonna have to program around it. Or if that is the exterior of the building, no problem, a truss might be a really good choice there. Okay, let's take a look at the columns. There was three different columns. There was one at the corners of uh, uh, 2B02, one at the middle of the two 2B02s, and then the ones at the ends of the 2B03s. So the height is the 3.2 meters divided by 20, and we get 160 millimeters as the minimum dimension, giving us an HSS 203 by 203 is a really good choice. Are you looking for some colored pens? Yeah. Need this back though. Scotch tape? Scotch tape is in the kids' um, well, Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. The no, the, the whole, kids have one. And there's markers and yeah. um, like, they have a whole craft display. Huh. I don't need those. I think you're wrapping my presents. I'm going to be really annoyed if there's no presents. Um, so an HSS 203 by 203 seems like a really good choice. 
column CO2. Looks like it's working a little bit harder. Um, we size it with the exact same sizing. CO2 and CO1, seem, CO2 seems to be working twice as hard as CO1. So it looks like that is something we maybe need to think about. Maybe just the wall thickness is enough to come into play when we do the final design. But this is where sizing guidelines really show their weakness, that they're not great at predicting everything that we need to. We have to use our own judgment. We have to look at the drawings and we have to think about it. I'm trying to give you some good context so that you can make some of those assumptions. It is not always going to be obvious. So the hard part of today is done. Now we're just going to look at some pretty pictures. I'm going to talk to you about what basic steel construction looks like so that you have a good idea of what that is. Um, you know, we realize that at U of T architecture, we're a design school. We're pushing boundaries, making things crazy and awesome in all the best ways but it means you're not often exposed to what's normal. So I am trying to show you a little bit of what's normal. Um, uh, it seems like my course seems to be the best place to do it, um, but it makes it hard because I don't get to talk about all the crazy interesting stuff too. So I've tried to sh shove all of these images into here. Um, there will be a few of the images in the, uh, the questions, but it's more to just kind of looking at the basics and to try to give you um, the ability to identify kind of the most normal things. This is a wonderful picture because it shows all of the basics of steel construction. This is such a good question. It would be wonderful in the exam, for example. Um, so we can see here that we have metal deck and it's long. Look at this. Our metal deck goes the whole length of uh, the building or the image. Um, but see these, see these lines here? That's where the deck is being attached to the steel beams below. I mean, first off, we can see that it looks the exact same above. So that's a pretty good indicator. I'm telling you that that's one of the ways they attach it. In fact, I can tell you, it's not obvious in this picture, but I know that this means they're gonna pour concrete on this. And this is actually gonna be concrete on metal deck. But right now it's showing us our metal deck quite nicely. Actually, you can probably really tell because you can see the tiny little holes punched in the sides of it. But right now we can see that this is metal deck. It might even end up being concrete on metal deck. We have some purlins here and they look like they're doing the job of picking up the deck. Um, and it looks like they're probably about every two meters on center. The, the purlins span into this beam. This beam goes from column to column, seems to be doing the job of a beam. You know, it's picking up the purlins and spanning from column to column. We've got columns here. And then over here, we've got something we haven't talked about much, steel bracing. We need something to stop our buildings from tipping over. So what we often do is do shear walls or moment frames or brace frames. And we're going to do a whole lecture just about, well, half of a whole lecture, just talking about lateral load resisting systems. So I can tell you that this is probably the most common one for steel buildings, and that is a steel braced frame that we can see in the back. And you can see it in both directions too, which is really nice. Here we have metal deck on open web steel joists. Um, if you've ever been in a Walmart or a, a Loblaws or something like that, you've probably seen this system up above. Um, you can see that these are probably about two meters on center. It looks like these then are, you know, 800 millimeters deep or something. Um, we don't know the exact context. It's hard to tell at the scale, but you can see that they're spanning from here all the way over to here. So that's the length or the span of the open web steel joist. And the deck, even though it's a long continuous thing, is spanning from open web steel joist to open web steel joist. Okay, this is one that's slightly more heavy duty. We've got metal deck, and it looks like it's deep metal deck. This looks like it might be 76 millimeter deck. On massive, these are not open web steel joists, 
as much as I've called them that here, because they're repetitive, these are something massive. Look at the size of those. So this would be something very custom. Here's concrete on metal deck, actually while they're casting the concrete. So until the concrete cures and contributes to doing the job, the metal deck is actually the formwork. So the metal deck is doing all the work of holding the concrete until the concrete cures and they bind together essentially and work together to be composite. This reinforcing that we can see here, this thin mesh, is crack control. There's a fly in here, sorry. This is crack control. So concrete cracks, 100% of the time, get your head around it, concrete cracks, always. Um, what we can do is, well, we know that it cracks usually as it cures a certain amount. So over a meter, it might crack, you know, 10 millimeters. By putting the reinforcing in, we'll still get that 10 millimeters of cracking. I made up that number. We'll still get that 10 millimeters of cracking, but we might get 10 one millimeter cracks instead of one 10 millimeter crack. So crack control helps us kind of contain or control our cracking for us. So this is composite deck beams. So this doesn't just make the metal deck composite to the concrete, it makes the concrete and metal deck composite to the beam. So if this is our beam and this is our concrete on metal deck, this little thing right here is the stud that we can see them anchoring down through the deck. And then when they cast this concrete, it's going to cure around that and it actually means that we can use a small portion of that concrete on metal deck as part of our beam. We can actually use it in the calculation. Now, I find in most of our applications here, um, we could make use of that and eliminate some of the structural steel, but then vibration starts to govern. And to solve our vibration problem, we need to put the steel back in to deal with vibration. So in the end, I found it hasn't made any savings and all it's done is an added complexity to the calculation and cost to the construction because now we have to fuse these steel studs down through the metal deck. Hollow core. A hollow core we're gonna talk about in the concrete section, but I wanted to show you here in the steel section, um, uh, it comes in four foot planks and it's an extruded piece of concrete, but it's really nice because instead of having um, deck spanning this way and joists spanning that way or purlins, the deck eliminates both of those things. So we replace two individual systems with one system. Cast and place concrete on top of steel is really uncommon. We wouldn't really do it that often. What I really liked about this image is it really shows us a, a roller condition. So this detail here can support load like this. There's a reaction here, but you can see that if we pushed right here in that direction, those two buildings could move separate from each other. So this is a true roller condition. Pin a support, but a roller in that direction. This is a, um, they, sometimes they'll call it a castellated system or castellated beams because they look like little castles. And I'll show you why. They actually, this is actually the steel member. And then they come along and cut it along that line there offset it, make it deeper, and weld it back up together. Now there's a lot of labor in this, but it saves material. In our market, you're going to hear me talk about this a lot. Sorry. They are waking me up though. I can't have any more coffee. I'm only with my sixth cup today. In our market here today, we um, are governed by labor costs. Um, 
uh, people are people working is expensive material is cheap so we solve our problems if, if we can cut out labor by using material we will in the 50s and 60s using material was way more expensive than labor um, so you could get people to do things really cheap if it saved you material and people you see that in some kind of these sculpted forms there was it was worth it because the labor was cheap but the material was expensive or at least relatively speaking um, this doesn't get used very often here in Canada because labor is so expensive um, when Dave and I uh, go to Germany um, and we're working on our, our masters and member tensile members membrane structures there um, it's at, in Dassault, which is in East Germany. Um, and the buildings there were built in the early 90s, just shortly after the wall came down, um, where labor would have still been very, very uh, cheap and material would have been very, very expensive. Um, and this system, it was the first time I've ever actually seen it employed, um, was the main construction type of the new buildings on the Bauhaus kind of campus site. So this is a steel beam and deck with concrete columns. Trades don't like to mix between steel and concrete. I mean, they tend not to like each other, but that is not even why. The main reason is that steel has a long lead time, but short erection time. It doesn't take long to put up. Concrete has a short lead time, but it takes a really long time to cure and get ready to go up to the next floor. Using steel and concrete together, you get the worst of both worlds. Um, so it, it doesn't take advantage of either one. It actually usually slows the system down drastically. Open web steel joist, open web steel joist framing into concrete. You can see that there's a little ledger uh, cast in here and the open web steel joist sits on top of it. This is a really fun system. This is a Gerber girder system. And I just want to find the drawing of this because I did that yesterday for you, for you guys yesterday when I did these calculations already. Not calculations, but, but notes. Um, I drew this out for you guys. So I'm just going to try to find it. Um, a Gerber girder system. Um, I found it. Gerber girder system. Um, takes advantage of cantilevers. So if you guys remember when we drew our moment diagrams of our simply supported beam, so this would be one beam, our, more, our bending moment diagram looked like that. So we have three bays, three beams. Well down here we have the same three columns, but we make one beam cantilever over the column. And on this side, we do the same thing. And then we put one teeny tiny little baby beam in there. Our moment diagram now is much shorter or not as deep here, which means a lower moment. Yeah, we've got negative moment, but it isn't as much as this as the maximum moment that we got from our main system. So if it's moment governed or bending strength governed, by doing this system, we can reduce the moment, which means we can reduce the member sizes, which means we reduce it, the overall steel tonnage, which means we reduce the cost of the system. Maybe not that big of a deal in one bay, but often in industrial style buildings, you'll have this repeated, you know, 10 times. So if you can take that amount of tonnage out 10 times, you can see a real benefit in your system. Holes and beams. If you have a hole, or if you need to put a hole in a beam, a general guideline is if you put the hole in the middle third of the length, and the middle depth, or the middle third of the height, you don't even need to reinforce it. If you have to put it somewhere else, you probably need to do some calculations to reinforce it. Just another fancy hole one. This one has a lot of labor in it. They actually took a bottom plate and a top plate and welded elements in. Maybe they have ducts that they're running through here. Seems like a really expensive solution to me. 
just another one with holes. Zed girts. These are um, these are these cold formed members that I was talking about. They usually are done on systems buildings. They usually support cladding or roofing, um, and they're proprietary. So every every fabricator of these types of buildings would have their own Zed girt system. So um, the base building engineer might do a rough preliminary sizing of it, but it wouldn't be the final, uh, what they would be responsible for signing and stamping the final one. Um, architecturally exposed structural steel. We can do beautiful, beautiful things with steel. We just have to let the fabricator know that that's the case. We can find um, published information from the Steel Institute in Canada that gives recommendations on what the fabricator needs to do, depending on what level of architecturally exposed structural steel it is. So if it's basic steel, they won't do anything. It's probably being hidden and you're never going to see it. There's level one, two, and three in custom that really is kind of related to viewing distance, how far away you are from seeing the thing will change what things you might do to it. You know, whether they're grinding dial in that seam on the HSS, you can see this is an HSS. It would have been really unpleasant to see a weld seam right there. So this one was told to grind it down smooth and then paint it. Often there's markings on steel. They need to paint or get rid of those markings and make sure it won't bleed through the paint job. Um, another image of uh, my project that I designed all of this steel for, um, the Gold Ring Center for High Performance Sports. We can curve steel. Um, but curving something gets harder the deeper it is. So um, you, can do, you can do a tighter radius if something is more shallow. But what's great about that is because we can weld and connect steel together, we can take small pieces to make some interesting trusses. Some basic steel details. We have um, beams connecting into the sides of columns. We have a brace just kind of off to the side here. We have a brace um, with a plate connecting into our columns and our beams. You can kind of see it top and bottom. Up here, this is interesting. We've got our open web steel joist, and this one right here looks like a purlin. Now, normally steel and um, our steel and our, uh, our, sorry. Normally our beams and our purlins are at the same spot. We put them at the underside of the deck like this. So you can see we do that. But when it's an open web steel joist, it comes with a little shoe on it. So our open web steel joist needs to drop down a tiny little bit. So bear with me. So in this condition, we have our, our open web steel joist, meaning we have to drop the top of this beam that's supporting the open web steel joist. So for some reason, right here, they needed to switch to a purlin. I don't know why. I'm sure they have a really good reason why they're switching to the pearl in there. But we can't have our deck going along at the top of the open web steel joist and then drop down. Um, so this pearl in, the top of this pearl in needs to be at the same datum as the top of that open web steel joist. This beam is dropped because it's sitting underneath the shoe of the open web steel joist. So this pearl in gets notched and connected into the side of the steel beam. This is a very normal thing to do. Just some crazy unique detailing. I'm probably getting out of the things that are normal now and more into the unusual things, just so that you can kind of see a cross section of the things that happen. Um, some really long steel joists, some long span trusses. You can see that these are so long that they come in sections that get supported and then they bring in and drop in sections in the middle here. When we do that, we need to connect them together. So they have to be held in place until someone can connect them together. 
In the field, we don't like welding. We like to be able to bolt things. You can imagine having someone sitting up here in the air with the hot torch and all the gear trying to weld that together when things are, when this one, the middle one is being held by the crane. You can imagine that that's a huge pain in the, in the behind. Being able to just put a few bolts in, a lot easier. So in the field, we like to bolt. In the shop, actually, welding is actually a lot easier. Um, they, they don't have to deal with fitting things up or holding them in place. They can just clamp it together and weld it up. So often in the shop, uh, welding is the preferred option. But in the field, we want to do whatever we can to get rid of welding. Here are some cool uh, steel trusses. Tubular space frame, essentially 3D trusses if you wanted to think of it that way. More curved steel, just doing some kind of cool stuff there. Spray on fireproofing. Um, so I said steel is non-combustible, but it is susceptible to fire. So it does not have a good fire rating. We can do a few things. If we need the steel to last in a fire, we can protect it from the fire. Um, we can spray stuff on it. We can encapsulate it in drywall. And actually, I should mention that in the Twin Towers, they did actually fire protect the steel. The blast um, actually blew off the fire protection. So then the steel was exposed to the flame in a way it wasn't anticipated to be. Um, so uh, we can put drywall. Drywall is actually a great fire protector and it has ratings printed right on it. Um, or we can spray on fireproofing. There's another, there's two other options. We can deal with it by making the steel thicker. So we can add steel thickness. Now, it can only go so far to help us. And a code consultant needs to be involved with that because that's getting outside of the structural application. But the, the code consultant will say, oh, you need, they call it an M over D ratio. Well, they say you need this minimum met M over D ratio. Um, the other thing we can do if we want the steel to be visual, but we still need to fire protect it, is we can use intumescent paint. Now, intumescent paint is a very special protective paint. It's got an orange peel finish. You've probably seen it. Um, and it looks like just thick, goopy paint, essentially, until it's exposed to fire. And then it puffs up and creates insulation around the steel to protect it from the fire, essentially. Um, intumescent paint is expensive. In fact, if you can use that M over D ratio value from the code consultant, to increase the amount of steel, so it's just pure tonnage being thrown at the steel, making it more expensive, it is still cheaper if you can get rid of intumescent paint. Um, so if you can solve the problem with steel, it is going to be cheaper than using the intumescent paint, but you can't always solve it with the steel. Uh, just a cool um, fabricated shape, so it's straight line elements making a curved surface. Here is curved elements making a curved surface. Um, columns, as much as we might design this as a column from this story to this story, sometimes they'll actually fabricate it as one continuous piece. These are wind columns. So these are columns that are spanning top to bottom and they've got axial load on them, but they've also now got um, a finish on the outside that when the wind blows, it's going to put those columns in bending. So we've got a combined axial and bending system happening. Just a, a very industrial building, um, more wind columns. But look, this one, we know that the in, in something in bending, that the moment tends to be the worst at the middle. Well, look, they've actually created their steel profile to follow that that we have the most depth at the middle where we have the worst moment. Some fancy built up plate columns. Um, so this is definitely me's, um, where it's just massive steel plates welded together to make these complex forms.
Uh, I showed you this in, in um, detailing, but it's showing a built up column as well. Cruciform columns. So um, this is another kind of um, fad that all of the, the, the big architects have done. And it's a really cool thing. I'm not, it's just that it is labor intensive. And what we've said is that labor is the most expensive thing. We try to do whatever we can to eliminate labor. So this, we can see we have, we have this plate right here, and then we have two plates right here, and four welds that we need to do to, um, to complete that. That's expensive, and if we can get away from that. So these were built kind of back when labor was still relatively cheap, and so throwing labor at it wasn't that big a deal. Um, it was still more expensive, but it wasn't the same implication as doing that today. We can get really fancy with our columns. Um, you can see here these ones again, where bending is the worst, um, have the most material. We can make columns be uh, trusses if we want. We can have them be trussed. Here's a truss column in three directions. Again, we're fall this must have bending on it. Well, I don't think it does. What I think they're doing there is trying to solve a buckling problem. So if we have a column, if I put a load on it, it tries to buckle. But look, it tries to buckle in the weak axes. So what they've done there is in all three directions, they've made it wider to try to make it more like this dimension than this dimension. Um, these are columns that are being held in place by um, stays. So you've seen this with telephone poles and light poles, or probably more telephone poles, something with a guy wire coming back off of it. Just a few more of those. Um, column bases. So I wanted to show you this. It's not a fancy detail or anything, but it is important because Probably 50% of the time, these are cast in the wrong spot. Um, these get sent to the site by the steel guy and the concrete guys put them in. And they might not necessarily know the importance of the exact location. So templating or giving having the steel people give them a template to perfectly place this can be really important. Um, because you can imagine if it's out by a lot, no big deal. We can probably solve the problem. But if that's been cast right here, and we're trying to put this base plate on top of it, you can see we probably have a bigger problem. A massive column base. Here's a column base that's doing all kinds of stuff. It's even got bracing coming into it. This one's interesting because this one has uplift on it. It's trying to pull up out of the ground. So instead of just weight holding it in place, we actually need something to stop it from lifting up. So we have to put rods down into the concrete quite far so that it engages the concrete. And when it tries to pull up, it's trying to lift up the foundation with it. It's the same concept we use for a moment base. Um, so you can imagine if you're standing still and your friend tries to push on you, you probably spread your legs to stop yourself from tipping over. It's instinctive and we know how that works. You are creating a moment couple, essentially, to resist that load. You're spreading that load. You're, you're, ex, you're making your eccentricity bigger to try to resist that moment. But that means one foot's going down and one foot's going up. So our reaction has to be in the opposite direction for each of those. So you can imagine if the load is going in this direction, this side's pushing down and this side's trying to pull up. So same thing, we need to get this going down into the concrete enough that it stops it from trying to pull up out of the ground. Here they are milling the base of those fancy columns that we saw. An arch. We can make arches um, out of steel. Um, as the load is coming down, we have it working in a combination of bending and axial, trying to switch it as much to axial loads as we possibly can. These are going to cause a thrust out. To make this a, a resolved free body diagram, it's going to thrust out on both sides. 
you know that if you if you stand with your legs splayed and somebody pushes down on you your legs want to kick out and friction is what's holding you in place go enough and your legs are going to spread out even more um, so we need something to resist those loads often you'll see big buttresses here to resist those kind of loads suspension bridge it's the same thing but inverted um, we have tension in these uh, with uh, something suspended off of it. So we have these acting in tension, but again, we've got this pulling force that is trying to pull out. We can often balance it by putting two of them side by side, but eventually we need to get to something where we can resist that load. And often at the end of multiple runs of these, we will see a big kind of buttress that we cast things into. Braces. Like I said, we're going to do a whole talk just about um, lateral load resisting systems, but I wanted to show you what they look like in a steel building. So here is a tension or compression element, um, a diagonal brace detail. That one's quite busy. Um, I just wanted to show you what they look like. So I put a bunch in. These ones, I probably just looking at the slenderness of them are tension only. So if that first one is under tension, we're pulling on it and it's engaged. But as the direction of the load switches, it will try to buckle. So in that case, for wind or earthquake in this direction, this one's engaged in tension and that one buckles. For a load in this direction, this one engages in tension and that one buckles. So we'll often have tension only bracing. Those are usually very slender braces, but we need more of them. Um, uh, you can do interesting detailing here. They might have needed to put a doorway in here. That's usually the situation I see. So if that was going like that, they wouldn't have been able to fit their door in. Um, angle braces, these would definitely be tension only. Uh, channels are often tension only, so we have, we have two of them. Um, one working in each direction at a time. Rods, same thing. They would definitely buckle in the compression load. So only one in this bay is engaged at each time. Um, so we actually have two bays. So both of these would be engaged for wind in that direction. And both of these would be engaged for wind in the other direction. Just another rod one showing some more details. Uh, we can do fancy, uh, or we'll, it, we have to, as much as we think about things in 2D, we have to remember that we're extrapolating from a 3D world. So I like this one because it shows that we needed bracing in all the directions. We can do some funky bracing as well. Like trusses, I hate naming things. Most engineers love to name them. Um, K bracing, chevron bracing, V bracing. They're all variations of the same thing. Um, I am not going to get picky about making you know which one's which. I've just shown you a bunch of pictures of them so that you can see that there are alternatives to the basic bracing. I like this one, the super bracing. Um, this story here, that's the brace, and that's the brace. And this floor right here, that's the brace, and that's the brace. They could have done that as the brace, on every floor if they wanted, it would have been probably a little bit harder to resolve because ultimately they would have had a very, very short um, lever arm or eccentricity or equivalent force couple distance. By doing this, they've engaged the width of the entire building, which means they're resisting that moment over the entire base of the building instead of just one bay of the building. <laughs> I like to show this image, and I definitely drew it yesterday. We often tend to draw our braced frame elevations looking like this, just stick figures. Um, it can be very misleading. I usually like to draw them with dimension and a plate, just to give a sense of what's happening in there. Um, not having an understanding of what those forces and connections look like or not asking the right questions, you can end up with some very unique detailing. Um, at this point, 
they've welded this plate on, this plate on, this, 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 and this, and then again on the other side. It probably would have been cheaper to take one plate, weld it, weld it, weld it, weld it, and make one solid panel wall, which you can do. And we did in gold ring um, in the end bays of our, our trusses because a truss and a brace are doing a very similar job. Um, we can use wood elements for bracing, but what I what I really wanted to show is that we still need steel. Um, even with the wood connection, even with the wood elements, steel comes into play. We can do eccentric connections, round or uh, bracing on a round building. I always like to say, you can take your pain once in one big lump, or you can spread it out in small increments. Instead of one big element in one or two bays, we have a series of small elements replicated again and again. Uh, this is a really cool system. This is um, the 134 Peter project, um, which actually my husband's office is in this building. Well, he's not there right now, but um, the, the, they're in the upper floors of this. So this is an 11 story concrete building perched above a four-story heritage building. And the mandate was they needed to be able to see the heritage building um, from the street as much as possible. But you can't just perch something in the air and it can't just be on columns or else it's trying to support it on something that could tip over very easy. So if you've ever tried to walk on stilts, you know it can support your load, but it's really easy to tip over. So they created these delta frames. Um, so I worked for Cast Connects when uh, these were kind of being created and installed. So these are these steel nodes that are about 30,000 pounds each um, and custom cast steel elements. But you can see that they've spread out the base to stop the building from tipping over. And there's three of these in the project. I don't know what's going on in the other room, but my kids are going crazy. Oh, I think we're almost done here. Um, Steel A-frame, so this would be um, kind of in our systems buildings. You can see that we would have a pin here, a pin here, and there'd be another one over here. And the two systems are leaning against each other and then connected. So if you try to tip over, you engage the two, the two frames engage each other. Moment frames. Moment connections are expensive because you inevitably have to do some welding in the field, and we don't like to weld in the field. And they do not save material. So more material and more labor and hard labor because we're welding in the field, all the things we don't like and make things more expensive. So do not start with moment frames. Use moment frames as a last resort. Moment frames, moment frames. <sighs> Marathon done. Um, so things you should know, hot rolled versus cold rolled. I'm not actually gonna bother you on that very much. You should know the nomenclature of a section and what you can infer from it and what things you would have to look up. You should know your steel stress strain curve. I like that one a lot. Um, you should know the basic steel properties, that table that I gave you of um, FY and FU and E of steel. You should know the steel advantages and disadvantages. Lists make very, very easy test questions for me. Um, you should be able to make use of the steel sizing guidelines. Um, you have the PDF, you have them in this, you have examples that I've done for you. You are going to have those in your assignment. And then you don't need to know all of those images, but you should be able to recognize some of the basics. Um, so that's it. Next week, we're gonna talk about the design of steel members. So this week we more or less talked about kind of the basics and what we would draw on a preliminary set of drawings. Next week we're going to talk about how do you pick the right member, the final right designed member. Okay guys, see you next week.